uh, it's really, really it's really, really good to be able to join you this morning. It's a little bit strange though, because I can't really see any of you. Uh, so it's, I'll, I'll work on being, giving the sermon without any feedback, uh, but it's really, really good to be able to join you this morning. Um, and so uh, as we start the sermon, uh, the text for today comes from a section of John where Jesus is speaking to a crowd that has gathered around him. Uh, what, we, what we have just read is actually the end of a sermon that Jesus is giving in response to the crowd. Uh, for the past few Sundays, the gospel readings in the lectionary have been Jesus preaching this sermon to the accumulated crowd around. And the topic has been the bread of life that he offers that will cause one to never hunger or thirst again. When pressed by the crowd, Jesus reveals to them that he is this bread of life who came down from heaven like manna that fed the Israelites in the desert after they fled Egypt. And some of the members of the crowd take issue with this idea. And when we get for the text for this week, the members of the crowd question how it is even possible for Jesus to give his flesh for his followers to eat and his blood for his followers to drink. And this is not an unreasonable thing to ask a question about, right? If we heard someone preaching something like this today, we would surely hope that this person was speaking metaphorically. And perhaps that's what those who were questioning Jesus in the text were trying to get him to admit. I can imagine someone saying, oh, come on, Jesus, you can't be speaking literally. That would not only be really disturbing and gross, but also definitely be against the law to engage in cannibalism. I can imagine that those who are questioning Jesus were waiting for him to clarify his metaphor, to explain this parable, to teach some deep truth about the world and about themselves. And folks, oh, how I wish that that is what Jesus had done next. This passage would have been so much easier to preach on if he had responded, yes, of course, this is a metaphor for how my teachings are just as vital for life as food and drink. Oh, yeah, that message would have been a lot easier to give a sermon about. Instead, what Jesus actually says is much more challenging and kind of disturbing. In the passage for today, Jesus doubles down on the very literal imagery of eating his flesh and blood. In the passage, there are two different Greek words that both get translated as eat. The word Jesus has been using up to this point has been a fairly common and simple word meaning to eat or to consume for life and sustenance. But after he is questioned in the beginning of our reading for today, Jesus starts to use a different word for eating. In verses 54 through 58, whenever Jesus refers to eating his body or the bread of life, he uses a word that implies the act of, of gnawing on something, a word that even insinuates the sound of crunching, as if you were crunching bones of a body. And so to give a little bit of context to this somewhat bizarre and, and gruesome statement, in the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is feeding a huge crowd that follows with only five loaves and of bread and two fishes. Jesus then leaves to go to another place with his disciples, but the crowd sets out to look for him and finds him again. At this point, Jesus accuses the crowd of only following him because he is able to miraculously multiply food. And then he launches into the sermon about the bread of heaven. And as we said, or as I said, Jesus identifies himself as this bread that gives life to those who eat. He is very graphic in his description. One could read verse 54 as those who chew and gnaw and feast on my body's flesh will have fullness of life, eternal life. Now, if you will all forgive the pun, this is a difficult idea to swallow. Without spoiling too much, of the next week's reading, this, the very next thing that happens in this story is Jesus's disciples going, this teaching is difficult. In fact, the text says that after this sermon about feasting on the flesh and blood of Jesus, 
Many of the people who had been following him turned back and went home. We are not alone in finding this passage to be troubling and offensive. And I regret to inform you all that even after taking one whole year of seminary classes, God has not granted me the magical ability to know exactly what Jesus means by his statements and word choice. But in the context of this part of John, I think the passage speaks to some issues that the church is facing today. Before Jesus gives the sermon about being the bread of life, he is actually on the run from the crowd that he is preaching to. At the beginning of chapter six, like I mentioned, Jesus' miracles have attracted a large crowd and he decides to feed them. Having no money to buy enough food, Jesus miraculously multiplies bread loaves and fishes to provide the crowd with something to eat. And after he has done this, the text says that the crowd realizes that Jesus is indeed a prophet sent to him. And Jesus flees from them because he knows that they would have tried to make him their king by force. Before long, the crowd finds him again and confronts him. And Jesus states that the crowd is following him for the wrong reasons. The sermon on being the bread of life is in response to this event. The crowd sees Jesus as their magical king. They wanted to plug Jesus into the power structures of their world in hopes that he would crush their enemies and turn Israel into a great and glorious kingdom where the people would have abundant lives. But Jesus rejects this idea. He says, no, I am not a king in the way you see kings. And instead, he describes himself as food. He describes himself as an offering of bread and drink that is consumed, chewed up, and digested. And that is what leads to abundant life. And so thinking about this imagery and the story, where else have we seen people try to make Jesus king by force. I have to say that for the better part of 2,000 years, the church has been making the same mistake as the crowd makes in this text. Throughout European and American history, we have tried to plug Jesus into monarchies, presidencies, military dictatorships, and all, all other forms of dominating power. The United States and various European powers have justified conquest and war in the name of our King Jesus. More than the United States and Canada both had programs that forcefully removed the indigenous children from their families in an attempt to make them bow to the Jesus that we made King by force. These programs not only helped to destroy the culture and history of indigenous tribes, but they resulted in the suffering and death of hundreds of unmarked graves are just recently being discovered at the sites of these boarding schools. Even the damage that we have done to our planet through overconsumption, greed, corrupt power has all been justified in the name of the Jesus who we made king by force. We, have a, we as a church have so long imagined Jesus in the same way that we imagine a king. We call him Lord and King in certain liturgies. Many of our hymns talk about King Jesus and use royal language to describe his role in governing the universe. Our artwork places royal crowns upon his head. And even our own UCC symbol contains a cross with a crown on top of it. For so long, the church has worshiped a Jesus who was made king by force. And look what it has done to us. So often, instead of being a force that counters the world's abuses and injustices in our society, the church has been a force that justifies or contributes to that injustice. Now, of course, I am speaking broadly. There are many, many, many examples and expressions of Christian faith that brings liberation and work for justice. And these expressions should be celebrated and learned from. However, we do have to grapple with the fact that when many people think about Christianity, they think about Indian boarding schools, 
anti-LGBTQ bigotry, the centuries of anti-Semitism experienced by Jewish people in Europe, and a whole host of other injustices. We as a church have to think about what it means to be a church, and we have to rethink this idea without the idea of our King Jesus. We have to rethink how we view Jesus. The Jesus who we force to be the world's king is not a liberating Jesus. And frankly, he's not even the Jesus who Jesus claims to be. In the work of rethinking who Jesus is and who we should see him as and who we are as a church, I think the passage for today offers something for us to chew on. When the people in the story tried to make Jesus the king by force, he ran. When they finally caught up to him, he desperately tried to make them understand that he was not a king in their sense of that word. He does not wield power like that. He explains instead that he is food and drink. He is the sustenance that nourishes life and makes it abundant. And when this teaching is met with misunderstanding and skepticism and hostility from the crowd, he responds by doubling down. I am food, Jesus exclaims. I am food and drink sent from God to nourish you. I am not a king like you want me to be. Chew me up, gnaw on me. I am food. Consume me and I will become a part of you and then you will be part of me. Do this and you will have a life that is abundant as God intends. And of course, I cannot give a sermon about consuming Jesus without at least mentioning communion. Communion is the primary way we as a church have put the idea of consuming the body and blood of Jesus into practice. During the celebration of communion, we take food and drink, and we put it in place of Jesus' body and blood. And depending on your theology and tradition, we believe or sometimes pretend that the bread and drink are actually Jesus' body and blood. In a way, the passage from John is talking about communion. And so moving forward, as we are, and the rest of the church largely, are in a period of rethinking our relationship with government structures and structures of power in our society. As individuals and as a church, I would encourage you all, whenever you take communion, contemplate how you personally view Jesus. What is the image that comes to your mind? Who is he to you? Ask, does this Jesus look more like a king in our world? Does he rule the world with a staff of iron? Or does he look more like food? Does this Jesus look more like nourishment? You see, Jesus in a way does actually rule the world and his kingdom will reign forever, but he does not rule like an earthly king or a president or prime minister or dictator. He rules the world in the same way that food rules the world. Without food, everything would fall apart. We could not sustain life. Economies would collapse. Food is quite literally the very bread rock of our existence as a people. And Jesus rules the world in the same way. So let's cultivate from now on that idea of Jesus in our church. And maybe as we wrestle with what the church's place in society will be going into the future, that idea of Jesus will create a more liberating church for it to come. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mark.